Um, That's yeah, market size. So we've got 30 million smokers in the United States, 11 million vapors in the United States. Yeah. You said 80 million vapors throughout the world, and we've got over a billion smokers throughout the world. You know, one one market that uh, you know hasn't really been tapped, and we were talking about this yesterday, is uh, is China. And there's a lot of smoking going on. And I think right now the perception is that people don't need to quit smoking. But you know that changed in the United States over the last you know since the 1970s to now. Um, do you think that could happen? In, uh, in China as well and be a market for cytosinicline? Yeah, I think there's a huge opportunity, uh, you know, rest of world and China being, you know, there's 365 million smokers in China alone. And I think historically there hasn't been a huge impetus to quit, um, but I think that is starting to change over there. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we could hit that uh, quite well as we think about progressing this product, uh, you know, through to approval and, uh, and commercializing around the globe, um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting category overall because we have seen huge strides in reducing, you know, overall cigarette rates, but there's still, sure. yeah, 1.1 billion smokers around the globe. Right. Um, and in fact, we saw an increase in cigarette sales during the pandemic, which was the first time in, in quite a number of decades where we've right. seen it's that. Right, it's declining, declining substantially. So, yeah, well, so the besides, market's not going away, that's, that's for sure. So besides China, I mean, that's one yeah. big market. I mean, where else did competitors, previous competitors like Chantix, where didn't they go that seem like good markets now? Yeah, I mean, uh, China's probably the largest. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think there, you know, this is a drug that can be used throughout the globe. And I think, you know, if you look at the demographics of smokers, especially outside the U.S., it is in a lot of poorer uh, type countries. And so I know there's been a lot of support and interest from the WHO to help get this product on mm -hmm. the essential medicines list mm -hmm. uh, to help make it accessible really throughout the globe in some of these underserved countries. So we, we think we can do a lot of good with this drug, especially over the long run. Yeah. And then, and then looking at vaping, um, 80 million throughout the world, 11 million in the United States. And I think it's probably growing pretty fast as well. Uh, what what do you see what do you see there uh, in terms of addressing that market? It, does it does it require any different approach than you would for for combustible smoking? Yeah, I mean, I think it might be a slightly different demographic. I think at the margins, it's generally a, a younger group. Um, you know, we have a lot. We've had the you know the huge issue with Juul early on. You know, really uh, attracting the younger with generation. The, the, the fruit flavors. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They probably never would have picked up a cigarette to begin with. Um, you know, but we also have a lot of folks that, um, you know, have, you know, made the transition off of cigarettes to e-cigarettes, mm -hmm. which, um, you know, are not without risk, but surely right. uh, a bit uh, less harmful than traditional and it's cigarettes. And it's still an addiction. Um, it's still an addiction. And, and there are some risks. I mean, you know, uh, we, we wrote about it in some of our research looking at, uh, I think we had some cartridges that explode. Um, we had right. some people get sick because of the fluid in there. And there's yes. also potentially some cancer causing agents in, the, in some of those fluids that's, that's in the cartridge. And, uh, you know, and again, it's an addiction. I mean, any of the other risks that, that are particular to um, vaping that, uh, you know, that might make more people want to quit? Yeah, I mean, I think the reality is inhaling anything into your lungs other than oxygen is going to cause long term problems. And I think right. we've actually seen some issues develop, you know, a lot sooner than what you typically see with cigarette consumption, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. like in the matter of, of months in, in certain mm -hmm. youth that are that are vaping. And I think that, you know, the issues with those products is that you can vape a lot more, a lot faster than what you can with a traditional cigarette. Right. I think the nicotine intensity is a lot greater, a lot greater. In, in and, the, and, uh, and you can be vaping. smoking or vaping the equivalent of a pack or two packs of cigarettes mm -hmm. very quickly, um, where, you know, a lot of times that could take many years for, uh, you know, you know, new smoker to get to those sorts of levels. So we, so we think we've got a perhaps a more addicted group, um, you know, that's coming up um, yeah. that may never have started smoking to begin with. Yeah. And I, th I think there's a lot of people probably who are young who, you know, got into smoking or some kind of addiction and they really regret it. And, you know, this is a way, way for them to stop. And, <clears throat> you know, we've talked about this before, just the side effect profile. I think a lot of people, you know, they want to quit, but it's just so hard. It's really hard to do. And, and, Sometimes when you take the medications, you know, there's a wide variety of medications and they all have some, you know, some issues with them uh, that, that make it very hard to do that. What, you know, I mean, so cytocline with this better side effect profile, you know, how does, how does that help people make that decision easier? 
Yeah, I mean, I think this is a category, you know, outs, you know if you look at what's available today, you've got nicotine replacement therapy, so the gums, mm -hmm. patches, lozenges. Right. Um, right. And outside of those products, there's really two available oral therapeutics, um, a drug called bupropion, which is a repurposed depression drug, mm -hmm. um, and then uh, Chantix or Varenicline. Mm -hmm. um, and when you look at the oral therapeutics, they both have a number of double-digit rates of adverse events. You know, we talked about nausea, close to 28%. Um, is what we see in the label for Chantix. Um, and so I think having something that's more tolerable will resonate um, with smokers looking to quit. And I think the other challenge or perception issue that we've had historically is that uh, you know, both of those oral therapeutics have had a historic black box warning for suicidal ideations. Right. Uh, and even though that warning has been removed, it's difficult to Still remove lingers, a guess, decade yeah. of you know, people yeah. believing that is an artifact with the product. So I think having you know, something new that will give patients hope that this is going to be the quit attempt that works for them, um, that is more tolerable, we think will really resonate in this yeah. category. You know, I was thinking we could talk about uh, the quitting process. You know, I think investors would be interested in, in hearing this, that it's not something you just kind of do once and, and, and it works. It's, it's actually a, a long-term process, which involves many, many attempts. So, you know, how do people usually start to try to stop smoking? Yeah, I mean, I think this is, it is a journey. And what we see is that the data suggests about eight to 11 quit attempts to ultimately be okay. successful. So if you think about the journey, it often starts with a attempt or two cold turkey. So without any support, um, while that might work for some, most people will relapse and, and go back to, to smoking. Um, the next quit attempt or two will, will likely be going down to the local pharmacy, picking up some form you know, of nicotine or replacement gums or, yeah, yep, available yeah. over the counter. Um, not terribly effective, often just leads to substitute addictions. Uh, my uncle still uses nicotine lozenges after quitting you know, more than four years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's quite common. Um, and then finally, you know, you end up having a conversation with your physician saying, you know, what else is there? Um, and you go on, you know, one or both of the, the two available options, you know, and I think what we see in our studies is a, uh, a heavily pretreated uh, group of, uh, of smokers. You know, we've seen, yeah. you know, over 50% of subjects in our trials have seen some form of nicotine replacement therapy. It's been close to 40% uh, Chantix or Varenicline, um, a lesser extent Bupropion. Um, yet they're all still smoking. Um, so I think, you know, this is a segment that really is underserved that could use another treatment yeah, right, option. Right, um, exactly. Yeah, I mean, in, in eight to 11 attempts, uh, it, you know, it provides a, a good opportunity to try out your product. And, you know, I think probably physicians, if they look at, you know, the information so far about the potentially better uh, efficacy and the, the lower side effects, they might actually gravitate towards cytosinocline before um, before some of the other options out there, which which have the, the, the kind of the, a little bit more negative profile. Yeah, and I think the, the beauty of this category, at least from a patient perspective, is that the Affordable Care Act mandates that all FDA mm. approved medications be covered. Mm -hmm. And so uh, these drugs are, you know, very accessible. We've seen, right. you know, Chantix, close to 90% of the scripts um, delivered with no copay. Um, and those that did have a copay, it was around $24, uh, you know, so you're talking about the cost of a couple of packs of cigarettes at most. Um, so it's a great category, uh, very accessible. Um, so, you know, we think having another option out there um, is something that will get widely used. Uh, you know, one interesting thing, observation that I've made, it seems like the FDA kind of has a war on nicotine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they've, they've, Kind of come after the, the the vaping products. They've they've talked about low nicotine cigarettes. I'm not sure the wisdom of that, but uh, you know what? But I think this is very helpful for achieve because um, they want to get some something out there to help people. So you know, what does the regulatory side of this look like, and how is that better than you know maybe some other uh, some other drug classes that don't have that kind of drive by the FDA to, to, you know, to make an impact. Yeah, no, I think you're right. You know, we've seen a, a lot of action here recently with the FDA to oversee nicotine. Um, mm -hmm. And that's both in, in cigarettes as well as in the vaping category as well. Um, so I do think we have a nice tailwind of support. Um, you know, again, there hasn't been anything new in this category in over 15 years. Um, so I think the FDA, frankly, could use a win in this category. Yeah. 
Um, and I think you know we'll probably get even more support on our uh, nicotine e-cigarette cessation indication because in that category right. there no are no products, products that are yeah. indicated. Well, that, that I mean because there's no other a product, it may even get you some kind of uh, expedited treatment by the FDA. Is that is that possible? Yeah, yeah. I think you know depending on the data, if it looks strong and robust, I think that's something we'll absolutely push for. Yeah, which could get you closer working relationship with the FDA or, or perhaps a faster, a faster approval. Uh, you know, one thing I've been asking all of my management teams is um, about inflation and shortages. I mean, I think, you know, right now we're, we're going through some trouble globally, <laughs> not just in the United States, but globally, you know, getting stuff to where it needs to be. I mean, I think all of us know about the, the auto chip, you know, the automotive, the chip problem in, in automo automobiles, but it's not just that industry or, um, you know, or, or any one industry, it's actually all industries. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you actually successfully held your, your first phase three trial and, and didn't see too many holdups at all. But I think you and I were talking earlier and, and I think there are a few observations you've made about shortages and inflation that you've seen, um, you know, uh, recently. And I just want to, you know, share that with our investors, you know, what, um, you know, what you've seen there. Yeah, it's been an interesting time. You know, we looked to launch ORCA 2, the first of uh, the two phase three trials. Mm -hmm. um, we did have to, to pump the brakes because uh, the pandemic kicked mm -hmm. up uh, right over the top of it. Um, but once we kind of, you know, understood the lay of the land with uh, our investigators and the fact that they were deemed essential businesses and up and running, we did proceed um, and ran that successful trial during the pandemic. Um, but yeah, there, there have, uh, it's not been without its challenges. You know, I think this has been, you know, we've heard the term, the great resignation, things like that. And we did have, you know, although we, we you know, we're a fairly virtual organization internally, mm -hmm. you know, we do rely on uh, contract research organizations right. to assist. Uh, and we've seen a huge amount of turnover on their side that did right. create some challenges um, as we ran that trial. And I think even here more, more recently, we've seen some uh, supply shortages in terms of some of the kits right. that we need to supply uh, mm -hmm. to our clinical sites. You know, thankfully nothing that's really disruptive, but yeah, I think to your point, it really is reaching across all, uh, you know, areas of the economy. Yeah. And actually one thing I think that should put investors mind at ease is I think you mentioned you have three years of product um, that's been built up. Uh, that, that's the goal. So we've been, yeah. you know, focused on, you know, a, you know, creating a stockpile of the yeah. product. Um, mm -hmm. You know, our focus is to have no more just three years. Anymore, no, right? no, no. We want to have as much <laughs> as we can. So we're ready because we think, you know, there could be a, a huge amount of interest in this product out of the gate. Yeah. Um, so we want to be prepared for that. Okay, great. Well, any any other recent events in the in the life sciences space that? Uh, that uh, you think are interesting? I mean, you know, we've had, we've had uh, the space really for the last 16 to 18 months really decline quite a bit. Sure. And I think, you know, from an investor standpoint, that's a huge positive because that means there's a lot of opportunities out there, uh, a lot of upside, and they're, they're very inexpensive to buy. Um, you know, what, what do you think about the current environment we're in and what does that mean for M&A and uh, you know, investors as well to get involved at this point. Yeah, I mean, I think the sector has been uh, really beat up here over the last 12 plus months, um, and we haven't been immune to that. Um, but I think we are hopefully starting to see things level out um, with, uh, you know, people coming back into the market. And I think we have seen some deals even this year, some pretty sizable deals with Biohaven as well as Zogenics mm -hmm. that I think hopefully breathe some new life. Uh, into the sector and show that, uh, yeah, you know, pharma is looking for assets out there. And mm -hmm. I think that bodes well for us long term, because I think at the end of the day, this product is best served in the hands of uh, a pharma or big biotech, you know, that can really maximize the opportunity, because this really is a, uh, a huge market for us. You yeah. know, when, when, Chantix Primary was, care market, yeah. when Chantix was originally launched, it was meant to be a $2 billion uh, a year product, but uh, you know, having to put a boxed warning on that product three years into launch uh, really limited its uptake. Mm -hmm. um, and I think Pfizer did a nice job getting that up to 1.1 billion uh, at peak sales. Mm -hmm. um, but we see a, a, a real opportunity, um, you know, with this product. And you know, we haven't talked about it, but kind of the, the end of Chantix, you know, it is no longer on the market. You know, right. They had some Pfizer, contamination. Yeah, they had a potential yeah. carcinogen in the product and ended up withdrawing mm -hmm. it globally uh, last year. Um, and we've now seen with the first generic entering the market, um, you know, with, uh, without any competition, it's on a run rate at the moment to do about 300 million uh, in okay. annual sales in the U.S. 
Um, and that's about you know 50% of the unit sales of Chantix before okay. it was withdrawn. Um, so I think you know this is a Just segment. A lot more, a yeah. lot more left there. So I think that bodes well for you know what we believe is a uh, a better product. Um, you know there should be uh, lots well, of demand out well there. Well, that, that brings me to the question. You know we, we talked about a billion dollars being where Chantix had 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 re you know at, at the level that Chantix had reached. Is that a good benchmark for for cytosine I mean. The environment's a little bit different than it used to be. We got vaping. Um, mm -hmm. We've got, uh, you know, we've got a, a potentially better product. We've got, you know, potential geographic expansion uh, that that Chantix never achieved. So, is that billion dollars kind of an understatement of what uh, you know we could we could get? Yeah, I mean, I think, think? Uh, I think there is more potential than that. And I mean, I think if we can deliver on the product profile that we believe we have, you know, about 75% of Chantix historical revenues were coming from the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, so at peak, they got to about 900 million here. But, but when you think about it, you know, there's 30 million smokers in the U.S. and a billion worldwide, that's what, 3%? So 75% yes. was coming from that 3%. So, I mean... And they, you know, haven't really sold anything in China. There's even countries in Europe um, yeah. where I think after the boxed warning, it was never reintroduced to the market. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there is potential to to expand broader than what uh, than what uh, we saw with Chantix. Mm -hmm. um, but the focus out of the gate will be the U.S. It is kind of the largest global market, um, sure. and again, best access for patients and everything else. So this is where uh, we want to start. Well, and the FDA, you know, getting approval by the FDA opens up the opens up the gates for other other Correct. agencies to also approve it in their countries as well. So, well, that's great. Um, last thing I wanted to ask about was just, uh, you know, the M&A, uh, again, the M&A uh, environment from your perspective. Uh, have you had discussions in that in that arena? I mean, you know, that's that's in our opinion, that's the end game, um, right? As, as, as you had just mentioned as well. What, uh, what discussions have you had or do you plan to have? Or, you know, what's your strategy on the M&A side? Yeah, I mean, we can't get into specific discussions, but um, you know, we are running a process to to find a potential commercial partner. Um, you know, someone that does have a primary care sales force in place that we can plug and play this product into. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, there's a number of different ways this could go from a you know, a company that is uh, more consumer focused to one that has uh, interest in addiction, um, perhaps even pulmonary, just given kind of the synergies there with smoking related diseases. Sure. So I think there's a lot of uh, a lot of opportunities, and I, you know there, there's been a number of groups that worked in this space over the years. Um, but nicotine addiction is a really challenging uh, indication to treat. Um, yeah. There's been a lot that's tried, uh, a lot that's failed, you know, and I think we've got the benefit again of having a huge amount of historical data uh, supporting what we're doing here. So I think the probability of success as we proceed is, is really quite high and um, not something you typically see in a, in a company that's in late stage phase three development. Yeah. Great. Well, John, it was uh, great speaking with you again. And uh, thanks for sharing the story with, um, with me and, and, and all the viewers. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right.